Honourable and respected dear brothers and elders and mothers and sisters who are listening at home. Jazakumullah for that introduction. And uh, Alhamdulillah, those two people who you mentioned, I know them very well. Mawlana Ghalib is my judger. Yeah. So when people, obviously I'm half English, my mum's white. So I'm coming from a mixed race background. When I mean white, not just white skin, she's a revert. So I'm half Pakistani, half English. So when people, I've mentioned before, I said, they said, Crawley, you must know more than the Ghalib. I'm like, yeah, yeah, he's my chacha, he's my uncle. So people get kind of surprised. Make dua for Zahur, Sheikh Zahur, unfortunately, he passed away, Bichara, Rahimahullah. He passed away, may Allah Ta'ala, Uske Unke Darjad Blan for me, Allah Ta'ala, Akhirat Kamala be a son for me, or Allah Ta'ala, Jonah and Allah Ta'ala, Khidmat Ki Allah Ta'ala, Kabul for me. Ha, COVID, make the Jari for me. Allah Ta'ala, make things easy, inshallah. Now, the reason, obviously, when um, one of the things which I've come to address, and obviously there needs to be kind of like a, a baqsad or a, or a purpose as to why we're here. So, in short, I'd like to mention that, and I, I've made sure I've written some points down because I've got a really bad habit. I like to go off off topic a lot. So this is why I said I better make myself baband. And I've stuck to, obviously, a few points. One in particular is... The aim objective of why I want to even want to speak to you is to inspire people within the community to work towards a stronger, unified community. Do you understand what I mean by that, yeah? You men have got to be on one page, basically. And you've got to have that unity within yourself. And we're going to go through a few points, inshallah, in particular. <clears throat> For example, what do we even mean by community? Because it's a word that gets thrown around. What is community? What's the benefit of a community? What are the key qualities? What are the blocks to building a community? And what can people do to get involved in that community? So inshallah, there's something for everyone here. And I appreciate, look, I know our, due to Snapchat and TikTok, your attention spans are not going to be the best. But I am planning to talk for an hour at the most, okay? That's what I'm planning to do. And it's good to let you know in advance, just so you know, there's only 55 minutes. Then now there's only 50 minutes. Now there's only 45 minutes. It's like now we just got to bear with this guy another 45 minutes. Karate, karate, inshallah, we do one. If I go over the time and the topic, you get me. But we'll try our best, inshallah. You know what I mean? First and foremost is that I want to mention that <clears throat> majority of people that are sitting here, you came here because, or your families came here, your parents came here, your forefathers came here, frankly, because it was to seek a better pasture. You get me? Whether you're from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Somal, Jazair, Maghrib, Donas, wherever you're from, there was a thinking or a thought process that occurred in our elders, and that was, go to England. It's a good life. You learn money. And that's the, that, let's understand that first and foremost, because if you understand that, then it'll make sense as to what I'm going to talk about in a minute. So you have to acknowledge, firstly, why did we even come here? Now, for those who are coming here, the only one person was, was really the majority of us that came more sort of from 50s and 60s was for economic reasons. There was a need for the country to be really rebuilt back up after the Second World War. And that's where a lot of migrant communities came in. Tika, there are obviously more recent years, especially, especially after the war on terror or the so-called war on terror, that you have people that are fleeing their countries because of Ahwal and the war zones, okay? But the majority of the Muslims that came here, the majority came for economic prosperity. Now we've come here, we find ourselves in small pockets of communities all throughout UK. Now, if you ask me personally, now who is second, third generation, I've got a, I look at UK as home, and that doesn't make me a coconut or it doesn't make me a sellout. I think of UK as home. I don't, I don't think of another country as home for me. I could, not, I could not picture a lie. Obviously, if you think hard about it, you can picture something. But when someone instantly says, home, identify a country, we instantly say England or, or something within the boundaries of, of the UK. And that's because we're born and bred here. We know life to be this. And I'm saying that as well because, now keep these two points in mind, inshallah. So number one is that we came here for economic prosperity. And number two is that we consider ourselves part of this society. And we should never be unmindful of our contribution as a minority to the society. Understand that, alhamdulillah, Muslims also contributed. You get me? Muslims contributed. There was, alhamdulillah, a lot of effort by migrant communities to rebuild back up UK post-Second World War. But nevertheless, how do you define a community? How do you define a community? What is a community? 
who's got a nice definition they want to share and I'm going to preferably ask this preferably the brothers who I'm with not to say anything because obviously that's the thing we've spoken about locally and so on but I want to know from you guys who can raise their hand and give a comprehensive without accessing your phone or even worse chat GPT and give me a definition as to what is a community sorry common unity okay unity fair enough is there anything else what, how would you define a community? Bro, you man that goes to school, yeah, you should know this. But Jolo, if you don't, but uh, I don't know, maybe, well, I don't want to mention anything negative, bro. But anyway, if anyone has a definite, so Uncle mentioned unity, I get that, absolutely. How would you define a community? Care Sorry? Social get together. Social get together, okay. Caring for each other. I'll save you the pangs just because I see some of the youngsters looking and say, What's the more we talking about, bro? Like, bro. So, okay, let's just move ahead, inshallah, and I'll just come to the point. It's like this. A community can be simply defined as a number of people sharing or having certain attitudes or interests in common. Did you hear what I said? You share an attitude and an interest in common. That is a community. Keep that definition in mind, Shala. So there's three things I mentioned. We came here for economic prosperity. And also, in addition to that as well, is that we've got different pockets of people. We've contributed to society. And also now the definition of a community. Allah Ta'ala refers to us as brothers. Anywhere you find a believer, whether it's Chorley or Crawley, whether it's London or Gatwick or Glasgow or Edinburgh, east, west, north and south, if you are a Muslim, I didn't, in, instantly that makes you a brother of another Muslim, you are all one part of the larger family, do you get it? And that is something which, alhamdulillah, which we have between us. And Allah Ta'ala mentions as well, فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ Therefore, because you are brothers, you should make peace and sulh, and you should make a common understanding between you. And you should have taqwa, and you should also fear Allah Ta'ala. Furthermore, if you do this, what will happen? لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ So if you have mutual brotherhood, you also, in addition as well, you make peace and amends between each other. And you have taqwa. The next result will be is that rahmah of Allah will descend upon you. So Allah has already told us the ingredients. If you can have these three key things in place, the community will be in harmony, inshallah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he mentioned, Al-Muslim, akhul al-Muslim, la yaslimu, la yadlimuhu, wa la yuslimuhu. The Muslim is a brother of another Muslim. I'm giving you the definition. If you're thinking, where have I gone? I'm here with you, inshallah. I'm telling you what is the definition of a community. One is the definition from a worldly perspective, a dictionary concept. And then there's another thing from the lens of Islam. So we already identified that we're brothers. We already identified that there's, we, are common, we are common believers. Are you guys getting this, yeah? And in addition to that, the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned the Muslim is a brother of another Muslim. He never wrongs him. He never wrongs him and he never ever forsakes him. The definition in Islam of, of community, we refer to as Ukhuwa with a common goal. That's the difference between us and a wider community definition. The community definition in terms of a non-Muslim perspective, or rather call it a Western perspective, is a common people that gather with a common interest. We have a common interest and we look at each other as brothers. It goes even deeper, it goes a, 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 lot, a lot deeper than that, where you consider somebody as your brother. And your aim and your goal is one, and that is to strengthen each other with the aim and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are you guys following this, yeah? To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to strengthen one another, and also for the sake of working on a common interest. That's the definition of a Muslim community. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, Al-Mu'min lil-Mu'min kalibunyan yashuddu ba'duhu ba'da. Believers for believers are like, a, are like a wall, like a building whose different parts, they enforce one another. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he, in, he, he joined his fingers like this to indicate the unity between believers. Now what, the question arises is that, okay, all right, cool, I get it. Muslims should be a community. But the one thing is, is that it boils down to, this is where the litmus test is. Do we treat everybody as part of the community? 
Do we have pockets within our community? Are our focus, our concerns aligned? Do we all have the same view? Now, I will leave you to be judge and jury for yourself, mate. You got to you got to know that yourself. The easy way to do it is to ask that revert who's been a revert for 15 years, do you feel accepted in the community or not? Shadi or Have you been married yet? Normally it takes a long time for people to be welcomed in our communities. And look, these may be uncomfortable things to talk about, but the reality is we have to talk about them to thrush them out. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I'm sharing this with you from a first, first personal, first-hand basis. Until today, my mother never felt she's part of the Muslim community. Do you get it? And any time there was a gathering, they'd always say to her, Oh, you know how to cook roti? You know how to cook salad? Like, bro, this is serious. Like, you, you've taken our culture. But they never asked her, do you know Surah Fatiha? What's the condition of your salah? You know, now your whole family have abandoned you and ostracized you. Do you know how difficult it is around the time for reverts around? And it may seem, to us, it doesn't make sense. Around the time of Easter, Christmas, these are things when reverts hit rock bottom. It's because that's the one time of the year where families get together like nothing before. Now we take this for granted because we're quite close-knit communities, isn't it? Every day we have, mashallah, people around us and we're quite close-knit. And from, a, from an English perspective, it's not always like that. It, generally, people live individualistic lives and people get together around, around, the, around the holidays, specifically Christmas time. So this is a time when reverts feel even more depressed is because that's the one time they remember connection with their family. So they neither have their own family, they don't even have the Muslim family, they're literally living by themselves. And then we want to say, why are people leaving Islam and so on? That's a whole host, of, that's a different bayan within itself. The care we need to provide for those who accept Islam. It's a different topic. But my point is just saying like this, is that what, how have we catered for those outsiders, quote unquote? If there's, a, if there's a group of brothers in a masjid, and let's just say they don't speak our same language, do they feel welcome in our masjid? Do they feel like I can walk in and I'm treated like, like everybody else? Now, I, I was once, subhanAllah, and this was really, un, I mean, I, 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 my, luckily I gripped the brother up for this, right? There was me, two other brothers standing there, and there happened to be another brother that was also there as well. And the brother was, mashallah, uh, uh, he, a Gambian brother. Beautiful brother, mashallah. So one brother came, gave salam to one person next to me, one to me, but he didn't give salam to the African brother. Now, that doesn't mean he was being racist. He wasn't out of race, because I know he's not like that. But it was just a simple gesture like this. Assalamu alaikum, and he gave salam to the person. Assalamu alaikum, Mawlana, and that's it, then he walked off. And I said, oh, bye bye, you be the Muslim, I said, he's your brother as well, right? He goes, yeah, yeah, I, I just didn't know him, that's all. But you see what happens is shaitan will plant the seed of doubt. He, do you know why he didn't say salam to you? Because you're a black brav. Because you're not welcome in their community. You're an outsider. That's the sort of thing shaitan puts in the head. Now there may not be no basis for that. But if we done the prophetic ideal, give salam on who you know and who you don't know. That's the prophetic ideal. Inna min ashrati sa'a. Ayusallimu rajul ala rajul. La yusallimu alayhi illa lil ma'rifah. That's the hadith. From amongst the signs of qiyamah, someone will give salam to another person, not because he's my Muslim brother, it's only because he knows him. That's why he's giving salam. So I said, bro, you give salam. And he goes, no, it's nothing personal. But you see, had I not clarified that, then that brother would have thought, Yad, am I that much of an outsider in the, amongst these people? Do you see what I'm saying? This is food for thought. I gave you why the need for a community. So it's easy to say, mashallah, the Muslim community. Who are Muslims exactly in your community? Do the Gujaratis have their own community? Do the Pakistanis have their own? Amongst the Pakistanis, do you have Pathan and Punjabi have their own? Punjabi Association, Pathan Association, Mirpuri Association. Surti and Baruchi Association. Look, this may not be nice things you want to hear, but I'm not here to just sing Kumbaya from the member. I need to speak what's haq. Because we go up and down the country. And what we're seeing is that this is, as we're becoming third and fourth generation, we're in our little bubbles. And this is becoming a problem. So what we don't want to see are small communities develop these problems because then you have people on the peripheral that are completely ignored in society. What happens when people start to feel ignored, which I'm going to cover in a minute, the harms of this, and I'll just chuck one in there now, is people then look for validation and acceptance outside of their community. And now some of you, and now let me just chuck this in, I love it, I don't want to chuck my credentials out there, because someone might be thinking, well, what do you know? You're just a Molvi, bruv. 
You're just a, just a Molvi wearing Sarvar kameez. Well, just for your information, I'm a psychotherapist. So not to blow my trumpet, uh, Sheikh gave an introduction about being in banking. I did a ma let me just show you, I did a master's degree in banking and finance, Islamic banking. Okay. And then I thought, bruv, this is some dead system. We're just making fat cats more fat. So I became an, when I was Imam, alhamdulillah, I did that for a number of years. Where I thought, or I feel, communities struggle mostly are three areas. Number one is aqidah and belief. Identity. And number three, mental health and their mental well-being. So this is why for me, I was more than lean or geared towards the social sciences and then I became a therapist. So the reason why I'm sharing that with you is because we have that. If you ask somebody, what got you into gang violence? What got you into drawing from a gang? Yeah, you come from a Sharif family, Rev. It's because he felt like a loner, an outsider, and they provided the acceptance. But it was, they were being groomed and they didn't realize. But there was a gap that felt in that person's life, they went that, to that direction. Does that make sense, yeah? It may sound grim, but I'm saying, look, we have to think how, do you know why it's so important that we have to think like this? Uh, you've given a youngster a phone. You've given a kid a phone. If you don't provide the acceptance, they're gonna go online to find that niche acceptance. And it's like this. You can just go and join a certain group, you know, you can bounce off each other for ideas, you feel accepted. Human beings want to be accepted. And then what happens within our own homes, we're finding people leaving the deen. Believe me, we've dealt with this. Front, front saf namazi, hajj many a times, mashallah, full system, I'm wearing full niqab, the son become atheist. Wallah al azim I'm sitting on the member in the house of Allah. It's my haq to speak the truth, not to water it down or to just say false things just for the sake of some wahwa. We don't like doing our dirty laundry in public. But the reality is, is that this is why I, I'm explaining to you the definition of a community and now I'm coming on to you specifically why it's important for this particular reason. And to be, to have that constant fikr all the time. How can my community benefit? If anything, some people might be individualistic and say, well, what's my benefit? What's in it for me? Tell me, me it is miraki fadayar, tell me what's in it for me. You don't also need to look, think about it individualistically. It's not always about you. Wallahu fi a'un al-abd, ma dam al-abdu fi a'un akhi. I'll just share one simple hadith with you. If you want something done for yourself, if you want Allah to assist you, the easiest way to get that assistance from Allah is to assist another Muslim. Assist another brother. Through that, Allah will assist you. Because check this out, you have money, right? And you keep it hoarded between yourself. <laughs> You're a person who Allah's curse is upon. You're just hoarding money and feeling, yeah, yeah, pass up, pass up. But then you have those individuals that are spending on people, looking after people, the welfare of people. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees this person as a means and instrument of khair, Allah gives more. If we give more, he's going to spread it. So this is a way how to win that. Do you get it? And obviously this is, a, this is not a bayan about the virtue of sadaqat and so on. You've probably heard from your ulama. You spend one, you get ten back. Point is this, is that when you seek avenues to help your Muslim brother or sister, Allah will assist you. So look at it as a communal obligation, obligation and a fardi kifaya of working to build the bridges and building hearts. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to Muslims and he mentioned he, he mentioned Ya Haqqa Tuqatihi Wala Tamutuna illa wa antum Muslimun. Wa Tasimu Bihablilahi Jamia and Wala Tafarraku. And I can finish the verse, but this is the first part which I want to focus on specifically. Allah refers to the Muslims and says, Have haq of taqwa. Fear Allah how he ought to be feared. But then he moves on to another thing. Hold on firmly to the rope of Allah and don't be dispersed and don't, uh, don't be divided. In unity, there is strength. In unity, there is strength. There's a pase manzar or you can say the sha'na nuzul behind this. It's too lengthy to go in at the moment. But there was some discord that was about to happen amongst the sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in. And this verse was revealed. Fear Allah, always unite. Basically, it's talking about unity. Unity is such a thing, right? It cannot be achieved unless you're doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fear Allah and then hold on to the rope of Allah. The rope of Allah means what exactly? The majority of the Mufassirun, specifically Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he refers to the rope of Allah as being the word of Allah, the kalam of Allah, the Quran. Muslims need to hold on firstly what is clear cut within the deen. Do you understand? And that's why that should be our constitution, that should be our premises, our base. 
that should be from where everything else stems off. Do you understand? So keep this in mind, inshallah. The reason why I'm touching upon this is because similarly, if, as the Muhajirin and the Ansar, something was instigated between them and now there was a fight that was about to kick off. This is why these verses were revealed that fear Allah and hold on to the rope of Allah. You used to be en- enemies to one another. Allah made you brothers. You were on the verge of going Jahannam. Allah Ta'ala made you brothers. Sahaba realized that they were, this was an attack on them to get them to fight. Like I said, it's a long thing issue. I don't want to go into that. I'm just looking at the essence of the ayah. It's talking about unity, to have unity amongst yourselves. Okay? The question ar- arises like this. Is when we talk about unity, Allah forbid, a big marad, a big illness, a big issue that's crept into our communities. Wallahi is colonialism, nationalism. It's nationalism. We look at each other as different based on literally a border. Muslims, wallahi al-azim, we need to take this out of our minds completely. It needs to be completely shunned, broken, and bunned away with. Wallahi al-azim. If I, this, is how, this is how ironic it is. First of all, let me ask you guys, is anyone aware of the Sykes-Picot agreement? You don't know history, no? Let me share something with you. There were two individuals, Mark Sykes, Francois Picot. Basically, what these two guys did, right, this was by the end of the World War I, what they did is that they sat down literally, this is no joke, they sat down with a map and literally draw maps with a pencil and ruler, divide, bro, how, have you, anyone seen that in Egypt's map? Just take Egypt. It's like a, just a complete square, like who the hell, who decides that? Do you get what my point is? These were, build, these were barriers, these were borders, not that were defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were defined by two individuals. It's a border that was drawn between the two people. It was drawn. And whether we want to hear this or not, because this is touchy stuff, even people, even if you look at, even Pakistan itself, India, it was drawn, these borders were drawn. Bangladesh was drawn. Saudi, Yemen, Oman, all these things, they were borders that were drawn. But more specifically, right, is that if you look, I mean, not, not specifically, they sat down literally with pencils, dividing the whole region, and they cut through some volatile regions. Have you ever, obviously, have you heard of Kurdish people, right? Kurdi. Kurdi, if I, need to, I don't want to give you a history lesson, because that's not the focus of my thing, right? This is how mad colonial nationalism is. It was split into four regions. Part went to Iran, part went to Turkey, part went to Syria, part went to Iraq. It's literally, it's like, I can't even explain it how, it's like, going into London and dicing it into four parts and saying now north, south, east, west, you're all different countries. You're all, this is one slice of the pie, this is another part, this is another part. And based on two people sitting down and drawing a line. Now what happened was it was done like this. Once you draw the borders, the next step is to create a sense of identity, pride. You're a Pakistani loka, yaar. Asan Gujarati loka. Like, you know, that sort of mentality, you know, would die for the motherland, die for the homeland. For what are you dying for? Nationalism. Did the Sahaba ever fight because gee, I'm, I, I'm just an Ansari? I'm just from, I'm from Medina. It's batil. Wallahi, these are batil ideas. This is complete jahiliya. It's complete against the fabric and, and the fiber of the uh, fabric of being a Muslim. But there's having love. Like I love, wallahi, I love England. I love, I love cruelly. I love it. Literally, no joke. I love cruelly. It's where I'm born and bred. I've benefited from there. And I wish khair and good for the people. I, I, my, listen, my wanting to practice on the deen, obviously number one is so I can get the pleasure of Allah, strengthen my community. But you know when they have this thing, oh, you people want to bring these laws and bring... I'm, I want to share these ideas with you because I want the betterment for society. That's why I'm sharing these ideas. You get me? Because I think that if the society were to hold on to Islamic values, there are things that you would benefit so much more from. The nuclear family has been broken down within, an, within it's breaking down within, you know, within, within our community, our wider community. You have like families, one child, some no children, work their whole lives at the age of 65. Well, there's, no, there's no immediate family. Now for us, this is like bonkers. Like how can you live in a society with no kids? But you see, it's these things that have led to where they are now. The, you know, anyway, like I've gone off on a tangent. So I was mentioning about us having ikhtilaf, I'm alright brother, it's cool, it's like I'm alright. I, 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 we, we, we basically have ikhtilaf with one another based purely on a division. I asked one, I was, I was looking into the whole surti baruchi ikhtilaf, right? 
and I was studying this, that what makes it different? Because when I look at people, I can't see no different. I can't see difference. And sorry if I'm touching on toes here, I'm sorry, but it's a reality. Literally, a lake separates. This is one side, that's the other side. It's as simple as that. It, it, it is not, it's not even a different nation, nationality of people. There is a distinct difference between Pathan people and Punjabi people. There's distinct difference. Genetically difference. They're not all the same in that sense. There's difference in language and culture. They're, they're so different. But you're talking about something that literally, this is, it's like saying, uh, what's your neighbouring town? Preston. Preston. Is that literally border? Yeah. So like Preston's another country. Like, it, that's how the beef is, literally. Like they're completely different from us. It, you see, as a Muslim, we can't have this thinking. But this has crept in. I want to share something with you, subhanAllah, and this is something which is madness. Because as a result, we've got these nationalities and ethnic tensions that exist amongst us, and we regard each other as different from, from we regard each one of them as different. Now, until and unless we can put an end to this, wallahi, that's the way we'll be divided. You can sit here and talk about community, we're one community, no, we're one community according to your definition of community. <coughs> So like free was like, oh brother, you know, we need the unity. Okay, well, what's your definition of unity? Like we have, subhanAllah, Gujarati only madrasas, Pakistani only masjids, Sri Lankan only mak maktabs. So where's the unity? Look guys, I'm sorry, I know that some people may find this very uncomfortable. But these are conversations we need to make because we want the betterment for one another. So don't think, yaar, ye kyun ye kya re baat hai? Is tera baat hai, chhedni ki kya zaroorat hai? Chhedni ki is wajah se zaroorat hai because hum ghaflat mein hai. Or in Kuba, and I'm, we're going to come to a solution, it's not all doom and gloom, but I want you to understand this thinking was imposed upon you, this was exactly the type of thinking that was, was to be achieved from the plan of this whole drawing of borders. It was interesting because there was a former British minister, George Curzon, and he mentioned specifically these points. And the idea was, was to instill ikhtilaf, so Algerians and Moroccans don't get along. Tunisians and Algerians don't get along. Libyans and Egyptians don't get along. Saudis and Jordanians don't get along. Shamis and Levant, oh, subh, that's another mad one. Levant are one people. Jordan, Syria, or rather, where does it go? So Syria, uh, uh, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, uh, 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 Lebanon, this is all the Levant area, Sham. It was literally carved up and now you have racism that exists between the two groups. There is a massive kickoff at the moment, subhanAllah, in Egypt. We want all these Syrians out of our country. We want them out. Even subhanAllah, Rohingyas can't go back to Bangladesh because they said they're nothing to do with us. Why should we accept them? Do you see what I'm saying? So this is where nationalism creeps in. They're Rohingya, we're Bengali. Oh, they're, uh, they're Shami, we're Masri. They're from here, we're from here. Oh, you're all Kharji. So the Hisi goes very, very deep. Allah Ta'ala set protect us and Allah save us. What did George Chersen say? Let me tell you what he said. This was said openly without any, and I want to share this to you. It was said that we must put an end to anything which brings about any Islamic unity between the sons of Muslims. Listen to that carefully. This was the colonial masters who carved our countries up, bruv. We need to put an, we must put an end to anything which brings about Islamic unity between the sons of Muslims. As we've already succeeded in finish off the Khilafah, we must ensure that there will never arise again unity for the Muslims, whether this be intellectual or even cultural unity. Can you see how deep it is? Year, the year, the 100 years ago, this was already thought of. And we are divided amongst ourselves. This is why me personally, I got an invitation from one group of people. It was the country association and, and so on. And I'm like, who's your target audience? We're just calling people from this community. I said, I'm not interested. You can, I'm not coming. Because I'm not of that thinking where I've got, I'm only there just for Bengalis, I'm only there just for Algerians, I'm only there for the Kurdis, I'm there for anyone who says La ilaha illallah. You get me? And that's what we need to instill within our communities. Now, do you know what it is? It's easy to talk about this now, mashallah, it's nice and easy. Ha, unity, unity, it's all good. Tomorrow, if a Bengali comes and asks for your daughter's hand, are you going to give it in marriage? Now, these are, this is the part which now is very uncomfortable. And I say the word Bengali, if you're Pakistani, would you, would, the, would you give a Gujarati your daughter's hand? If you're Moroccan and now Nigerian comes, are you going to give your daughter's hand in marriage? That's where the litmus test is. So it's easy, oh, mashallah, falsify. Yeah, bro, unity, unity. We're all for the unity. Yeah, we're, in, we're, in, we're all for the unity when it comes to sharing a box of pizza. You know, or kebab or a community barbecue. But you want to talk about real unity? We have to break these barriers as well. Now, someone may say, oh, but Marana, you know there's that hadith, right, where the Prophet mentioned, تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعَةِ 
a woman's married for four things. Oh, you know, women can get married also for hasab, nasab, and well. I know, there's the hadith. Culture can be taken into consideration. But what did the Prophet say? Look at the ending of the hadith. Always give preference to deen because if you don't give preference to the deen, you will be losers. Do you get it? So don't, I, I don't get me wrong, I'm not just saying here firing arrows in the dark. We've thought of this before we come and speak because these are very contentious issues. So I'm already giving you the answer to the etras that may come in your mind where people sit around and make tabsara. You get me? So these are the, <laughs> these are the issues. Sorry about that, big pardon. I was simply translating as people will find a fault. It's called an ad hominem attack. I don't like you, bro. Look at his kurta, bro. He must not be right. It's an, you're attacking the person, not the argument. You get it? It's called a logical fallacy. So when you've got nothing to latch on to, you'll attack him. I, I don't like this guy. You know what? Look at, look at the car he's driving, bruv. Look at what, what right does he have to speak about our community's needs? What on earth has his car got to do with anything? What's his... I should not listen to him because his brother's a na'udhu billah crackhead. What's his brother got to do with anything? Well, that's not the argument. To, to tell me about the argument. Now, I, don't want, I haven't got time to go into this, but I'll just share with you one example. One of the reasons why Spain was so successful... Spain was so successful. If you look at the history of the Banu Umayyah, uh, obviously Abdurrahman Thalith and so on, if you know history, if you don't, just take my word for it and read, inshallah. One of the things that made Spain so successful as a people is that they, they didn't go in there with this whole, you know, we are Arab, we are Banu Umayyah, and we need to establish Hijaz, Allahu Akbar, you know, the, this sort of nationalism. They went in there and they thought, okay, number one, we, our maqsad is la ilaha illallah. That's it. Our maqsad is to build community on the basis of akhuwa and brotherhood. They didn't go there trying to get everyone to wear clothes like them, eat like them. It was adopt the culture, but instill within the community Islamic values. Spain was a unique example. And subhanAllah, yes, it had its faults. And I'm not saying it was all, mashallah, uh, you know, bed of roses. It had its challenges. But one of the things which they did, that they did away with the barriers. And Muslims, mashallah, you know, they accepted each other for their different values and their cultures and their colors and so on and it became an amazing pot melting pot of different nationalities and one of the most thriving examples in recent recent history when i mean recent i mean sort of like in civilization rather but again that's too much to go into let me just re recap if you guys are thinking where have we gone to for so far we've spoken about the definition of a community why is it that it's important to establish community why what's the benefit and the benefit is is because allah subhanahu wa well, first of all why is a community important is because we are brothers it's important for the longevity of our community in the long run do you understand if you want to survive as a community long term you're going to need to think not like foreigners not like individuals not like mashriki and maghribi not like rich and black and white and poor uh, white and brown and rich and poor educated non-educated you need to think as one community and until unless we don't think like this, we will be easily divided because this has always been the strategy from day one. And until and unless Muslims can do away with this, we will fight bika and argue amongst ourselves and it will never come to an end. Now, as I mentioned, right, is when Allah Ta'ala in Surah Al-Imran, he mentions, Ya ayyul ladhin amanu taqullaha haqqa tuqatihi. Ya ayyul ladhin amanu haqqa tuqatihi. Uh, uh, tuqa so Allah mentions the believers. In Surah Al-Imran, the verse which I mentioned to you before, Allah mentions the following things. He refers to us as believers. So Iman, these are necessary and key qualities of a good community. Okay, and I'm talking for about a Muslim community. The quality of Iman, belief in Allah, unflinching belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, and when I mean unflinching, to be absolutely convinced that Islam is the most logical way of life. You have Iman. Not shuck, not doubt, not that you came from apes or bandar or whatever. You are, you are convinced that Islam is the way. But wallahi, in this point here, I can speak for hours. We have a crisis at hand at the moment. Now, we don't know because we've gone beyond the school age. But you ask these boys and girls what they're studying. I say girls, there's no get Well, bro, I don't know what man's are identifying as these days. You get me? But we think they're the boys anyway. We hope so, inshallah. And they are definitely, bro. What am I talking about? They are. Anyway, astaghfirullah, where did I go? Come me back a bit. I, I was saying that, you know, if they're not convinced of Islam, if they're not convinced of, of the oneness of Allah, of being a theist, of be having the, uh, having the not having uh, the wahda and the, and, and the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not going to become long before that evaporates from their life. 
you understand what I'm saying? This is the most key component, Iman. Iman is the key component. We need to therefore have those open conversations in our masajid, from the members, from the madrasas, from families teaching their kids. This is why it's absolutely imperative. We do ta'aleem at home. Do ta'aleem at home on a daily basis. Every day, take our time. Qala Allah, qala Rasul, instilling within the children the, you know, the iman in Allah, the love of the Prophet Sallallahu These are really important things. So Allah Ta'ala firstly mentions iman. Secondly, Allah Ta'ala talks about taqwa. And then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala mentions after that unity. So these are some key ingredients. Now when it comes to the Sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'een, okay, let me, let me just share with you. What was the Sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'een's example? When Sahaba radiallahu anhu majma'een accepted Islam, they had one purpose and one purpose only. And that was how can Islam flourish and how can I be utilized for the sole purpose of the spreading of this deen? It was like automatic. The moment they accept Islam, they knew that this is my job now. I have to do this too. And wherever Sahaba went, whether it was Egypt, whether it was Damascus, whether it was Sham, Iraq, wherever they went, they enriched society with Iman. I find it bonkers, honestly, that you even have people from amongst the Muslim community that frown at the idea of doing da'wah in the outside non-Muslim community. I, 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 I don't get it. I really don't get it. If you, you're making a claim, you need to provide me evidence that you're not supposed to do it. Because all the ayat are talking about da'wah. All the ayat are talking about Amr bin Ma'roof. It doesn't just apply to Muslims. It's non-Muslims as well. Asal da'wah is non-Muslim. When we talk to a fellow Muslim, it's tazkiyah, it's reminder. It's, it, you know, you're, you're, you're reminding them. It's a reminder. You know, but da'wah asal is supposed to be to a non-Muslim. And you're talking about the call of tawheed. Now our situation is so dire, you, uh, you have Muslims coming up to you saying, yeah, uh, uh, tell me, is there even a God? Do I, is it even true? You know, so we, this is the, not really important that this number one thing, working on Iman, the Tawheed in our community, one of the key things. And as I mentioned to you, Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in, wherever they spread, they spread with the word of Tawheed. You know, we sit, mashallah, we gave, oh, you know, four Sahaba went to Indonesia, mashallah. But, you know, because of their efforts, whole, whole country became Muslim, Tika. How many people in your life have you given that way in UK? Okay, how many people have you invited to the call of Tawheed? That they came, we've got all these stories from the Salaf Muhammad, we don't make amal on it, ourselves. So I'm saying, look, I'm, you know, ask to point fingers at ourselves, give aqiyah, this is a good point, Do, have I done this or not? Then what is the maqtad and purpose? Why are we here as a community? We should want to enrich society, re- enrich them with their ideas, enrich them, subhanAllah. I honestly say this, no joke, and I'm going to say this, and this is, you know, I honestly believe if this was, like, quote-unquote, a Muslim country, honestly, I mean, for me, I love it because it's home from my sense, but this would be the insaf of the people, the justice of the people, the love of people, the acceptance, the openness, these are all good sifat. Bichare, they haven't got iman. If they had Islam and iman, bruv, they'd outdo us in a lot of ways, I'll tell you that now. A lot of ways. But the point is, is that when I, sh- I came back to my, my initial point, the key ingredients of a community, Iman and Tawheed, you have to make Amal on this, number one. And number two, I mentioned to you is that Taqwa and fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three is that obviously unity, that's the third thing. Now, so when you have these three ingredients, the first thing that we need to do is to correct our intention as to why I'm here in UK. I want to share a hadith with you quickly. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned al islam ya'lu wa la yu'la. Simple hadith. Check out that. It was a simple hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said Islam is always and always should remain superior and it should never ever be suppressed. Never be surpassed. Al islam ya'la. Islam should always be superior. It's never surpassed. Simple hadith, simple usul. Al islam ya'lu wa la yu'la. And Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een, they understood this. Their maqsad and motive was one. This was the driving force behind the Sahaba. What was that driving force? Islam should be superior and everything else should become and it should surpass everything else. They gave everything for this cause. Now I ask you, we are living in UK, Muslims migrate to any country in the world, that's their business. Why are they there? What is the main focal point? Why is it that they made quote-unquote hijrah from a non-Muslim country to a Muslim country to a non-Muslim country? 
What's the reason? What's your maqsad? What's your hadaf? What's your objective? Why are you here? For which reason? Where do you see yourself in a hundred years? Do you see yourself in a hundred years? You know, these are questions we, as a community, we should ask. Where do we see ourselves in a hundred years? But this will only be achieved if our motives and maqsad is driven towards one goal. And that is establishing the deen of Allah and the pleasure of Allah. Otherwise, it's not going to be long before slowly, slowly, slowly our communities then start to become weaker and weaker. And then basically, these masajid that you see, may Allah Ta'ala protect us. But we've seen it happen in Spain. Spain was a stronger Muslim community than what we have in UK. It came to an end with the Reconquista badly. Where you either accepted Christianity and you, they, wouldn't even, they weren't even allowed to make hijrah. You had to leave everything, all your belongings. And even if they thought you were leaving because of any other reason, because of a faith reason, bro, you were dealt with. People were, na'udhu billah, burnt. Obviously now, inshallah, halat won't, you know, obviously things have moved on since that time, or we hope so anyway. But the point is, is that it, the, the, the objective is this, is that it will become difficult to live in a place if you're not holding on to your deen. And as Muslims, this is the maqsad we should have, that we want to enrich society. We want to be- Look, let me ask you a question. Do, we, do you think the people here would benefit from Islam? Do you, ask a question. Do you think the English public will benefit from Islam? Yeah. Oh, definitely they will, man. Of course they will. 100%. It's not even a, even a question. If we have that thing, mm, I'm not sure. Bro, there's issue in your aqidah, bro. Definitely they will benefit from Islam. So my maqsad is here is to practice myself, safeguard my family, but to increase my wider family and the wider community. This is our community, right? This is our wider community. And when we start, because I'm not just here, oh, for the, you know, for the Pakistani lads in Cruelly, you know what I mean? Pakistani boys, I'm, uh, they're my community. Or the Pratan boys, they're my boys, you know what I mean? The Bengali boys, they're my boys. No, so everyone's part of this. Your, your immediate, we've already spoken about the immediate community. That's there. That keeps you safe, but how do you spread the message? When you look at outsiders as foreigners, you'll always shun them and bun them. So as a community thriving going forward, we have to think like this. So I said to you, number one, in the, one of the key things, obviously, iman, taqwa, unity. This brings, communi- this brings unity amongst our community. Yes, has everyone understood that? Yeah. But now in order for Islam to spread, what was the first thing I mentioned? Islam should be what? Superior. You need to have this drive. There's three things that bring unity amongst ourselves. Iman, taqwa, and sulh, unity amongst ourselves. Sulh, forgiving for the sake of Allah and these qualities. That will bring unity amongst yourselves. That's your three sifat. How do you then inspire the outside community? Because if you and me have this quality between us, that doesn't spread outside. That doesn't spread. That's just between us. I believe in Allah, you believe in Allah. I fear Allah, you fear Allah. I will make... Sulh between you, that means if you, not to you brother, I love you for the sake of Allah, but you just happen to be the nearest person. Haji Sab's more older, respectable, so uh, not to say you're not, stuck for Allah. Oh, yeah, let me where am I going with this? Let's just focus it. But the point is, it's Iman, Taqwa, and then Sulh, like, you know, أخوكم, to join ties, to forgive. Forgiving will happen only when I let go of my ego and my personal thing. Now, that will create unity between you as a, in, as a group. But in order for Islam to spread, Number one thing you need to think about is Islam needs to be superior and it must surpass everything else. The, the, everyone understood that first one, yeah? Now we're moving on toward the more bigger objectives. Another thing, remember, is that when you're talking about brotherhood and wider efforts, remember, it, brotherhood can never be attained on wealth or foreign methodologies that are alien to Islam. Now what we must realize is that unity and brotherhood can only be achieved even in a wider community only when it follows qala Allah and qala Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam meaning what Allah said and, and explained and what the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said and if we try to bring unity on anything else it will fall flat on our faces whenever you try to order that which is against the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala your hearts will always remain disunited. So it's imperative that we hold on firmly to that, and this should be our basis. Now, remember this one thing, right? Is that if you think to yourself, oh, yeah, this is a mammoth task, man. How do we make Muslims see eye to eye? You know, the Arab tribes of Makkah and Medina, they were more at war than we were. We're not at war. If anything, it's just a colonial line and a flag that separates us. Otherwise, we're practically the same people. It's amazing, because basically what happened was that I went to India, 
and we traveled around a few places alhamdulillah delhi first mustafa abad bombay amritsar for the league alhamdulillah i mean piran was it any law for the nia you know i mean bro we were for the for the dawah purposes alhamdulillah but it's like when i went through now like, amritsar went through to lahore i'm like it just seems like exactly the same people the cultures of the people are very similar just one guy's got a bug on his head and one hasn't the people the they're generally the same it, they're so they're very similar in, in terms of mehman nawazi, in terms of adab and ihtiram and manners to the elders. There's so many things that are the same with the subcontinent. And it's literally, like I said, there are lines that were drawn between the two things. So what is going to separate us? What, a flag? What, a line? Na'udhu billah. So again, like I said, I'm going back to that point again. We're not at war per se. The Arab tribes of Medina, they were literally at war. Muhajir, Aus and Khazraj were at war literally. This person killed this many people of my family. I've killed this many people of theirs. Literally, these men were on next level beef. So anyway, look, let's focus because we're going to come to an end, inshallah. We've got only 15 minutes left. I said the Arab tribes in Medina were at war. Aus and Khazraj were at war. The tribes in and around Mecca were at war with one another. What basically united them was brotherhood. In kuntum a'da and fa alla fa bayna qulubikum. Allah said, Do you remember that time you used to be enemies? Allah brought unity between your hearts. That comes on the basis of iman, taqwa, and unity when you let go of your egos for the sake of Allah. Unity will come. And that's what we need to do with the wider community. You're going to have someone that comes who's really super arrogant, he's harsh, he's offensive, excuse me, he's offensive. Leave it for the sake of Allah. Know you yourself that you are being humble, but it's for a wider purpose. And when you make tawadu', when you are humble for the sake of Allah, man tawadu'alillahi rafa'ullah. If you are humble for the sake of Allah, Allah will raise you and elevate your status. So the Arab tribes had more beef than we do, quote unquote. But, and, but the thing is, so we, if we do away with our egos, inshallah, for the wider community, inshallah, we'll be able to bridge gaps. It's interesting because each person plays an important role within our community. This youngster plays, where's Walid gone? Is there, yeah, mashallah. Walid plays a role, mashallah. Sheikh Huzaifa plays a role, you know, mashallah. Sheikh Umair plays a role, Imam Saab plays a role, Ajiz Saab plays, everyone plays a role. It reminds me of a story, right? There was one individual, someone came and they were laying bricks. He said, What are you doing, mate? He said, I'm laying bricks. Another person came, the same person was observing. He said, what are you doing, mate? He said, I'm building a wall. A third person came, he asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a cathedral. They were doing the same job. What changed? Focus, outcome, longevity. How we've got to think, right, is that my actions have a direct implication in our community. You have to think like this. When you're walking the street, don't just think you're just Abdul. Bro, you're part of the Muslim community. People are going to watch you and they're going to say, These Muslim, this, I saw a Muslim boy. I saw a Muslim girl. So your akhlaq needs to reflect that. And if you think that that's not the case, you're fooled by that. And astaghfirullah, before some of you think, Cathedral, you're in a masjid. It's the story which I narrated, otherwise we're not a sellout. But while we're talking on the thing of cathedral, this is a sign of qiyamah, right? which is another problem of our community, because I said I'm going to talk about some of the ahwal, and this is one of them. We embellish masajid, listen carefully to this word. We embellish masajid, meaning we focus more on the interior, uh, the exterior in terms of the fittings and so on, but our number one focus isn't the people. I said, but they get zamana tha, you know, back in the old days, when I mean old days, Nabi Sallallahu zamana, Salaf zamana, Sahaba zamana, masjid ek kachi hoti thi, log bade pakke the. In it, that there was a time the masjids were weak, the Muslims were strong. Now the, mus the masjids are strong, the Muslims have become weak. The polar opposite. So this is why, rather, and I'm not saying na'udhu billah, I'm not pointing to this masjid. Mashallah, you guys are probably doing a lot better than a lot of communities. I'm simply saying, as a community, if you think longevity, long term, one is obviously doing that well, one is being exemplary role models, one is the example of wanting Islam to surpass and survive and to be excellent in every field of life, but the other one is to understand the needs of your community. If we're focusing more on interior, exterior, oh, mashallah, did you go to that masjid? Oh, it's really good masjid. Why? Oh, yeah, they've, instead of lote, they've got pumps, bruv. Pumps. Like, is this the criteria? They have like, for example, I don't mention, but the one TV channel has the best masjid in, and they win an award. 
It's not about how many classes do you run, what activities do you hold, how many people become hafad, ulama, are you providing outreach work, that were facilities, that were training. Have you got a facility where youngsters can come and they say, I've got a problem, I really think that I've got an identity crisis, I'm having a doubt in Iman. Oh, I don't tell my mum yet, don't tell my dad, but I've got a bird on the side, bruv, what do I do? And well, like, we get these questions, do you know why? Because we're open to it. Now, forgive me for giving this house of Allah, you know, stuck for Allah. We're not trying to make jokes and fun here, Allah forbid. But I'm saying that when you, you be, once you open your doors and you don't judge, because only Allah can judge, yeah, we will guide. If someone, someone said to me, they told me the haram they're doing, they said, what do you think of this? I said, look, it's not permissible, but I respect the fact that you're seeking help. Let's work on that, yard. Allah judge, I'm not here to judge. Allah not come, merani, shukr, it's not mine. Like one guy, he came to me, Allah forbid, and I'm not saying this is right, it's haram, it's wrong, it's impermissible. He came to me and he was really upset and he was crying. He goes, Mona, I, honestly, I, I, I struggle with the opposite gender. I keep on having these girlfriends and I keep on doing haram. I was like, subhanAllah, wallahi, you're a believer. Wallahi al-azim, you're a believer. And he cried. And he said, and, I, and, it, and, it, and he said, but how do you, how, you know, I feel so, why are you saying that I'm a believer? I'm saying because, you know, the truth is, if you didn't care, and you continued sinning against Allah, I would say this person's a goner. Sinning against Allah, not even caring. The fact that you came to me knowing that I'm a quote unquote Molvi, a Molana. Like, you know that sort of mentality, the ulama are strict. If you tell them, bro, stop for Allah. So it took a lot of guts for you to come to me. Imagine the anguish you're feeling because of this haram and this zina you're doing, that you've come to me. This is a sign of Iman. He goes, I never thought of it like that. I said, it's good because you know, I'm glad you're hearing it for the first time. But you see, it's a word of hope. On the contrary, I know somebody, the same example but by another person, one guy went to one particular, you know, he, obviously he meant, he meant well, and he said to him, look, I'm doing this. He said, listen to me, if you don't fix up your ways, you're going Jahannam. This is haram. He knows it's haram. That's why he's come to you. He's not stupid. He knows it's haram. Why are you telling me? Yes, it's not permissible. Okay, how do we solve the problem? And when I focused on a positive, that look, Yara, let's be realistic. Was it a big thing that he came to me to ask me help? That means he's struggling. And he values his iman. Otherwise, he's like, wait, button this deen, bruv. Wait, for Toro, Yara, who do I care? What do I care about Islam? He came because he was struggling and he wanted help. I was like, subhanAllah, wallahi, you have iman. He, he, this was such a statement that that you know, hit him really at heart. The point is, is that do we have these facilities in the masjid? Do we have these things? I'm, mashallah, I'm sure you guys do, but it's food for thought that we need to expand and we need to have outreach work. We need to be able to bring communities, understand what the communities need. And by the, why I say this, right, is that because if you don't understand these needs as a community, and I've mentioned them one by one, number one was I said that without having a vision for the future, without having like, for example, the idea that Islam should be superior. Number two is that having brotherhood only on the base of qala Allah and qala Rasul, not foreign ideologies. When I mean foreign ideologies, if you think Islam will bring us on you, we, we don't need Islam, we need this ism and that ism and this ideology, wallahi al-azim, it will fail. I gave you hadith, and the, uh, the Prophet says, I mentioned, you, until you do not order by the word of Allah, your hearts will remain disunited. So you can bring any ideology because you know, like some people, they say, Jini, I think Jimariki personal thought okay, if you do this to the Ummah, this will happen. Bro, I don't care what your thoughts are. Don't come here with your Jini, you know, I think we should do this. I, you know, I think we should, everybody should go into this. And our problem, is lack of sanitation, our problem, lack of weaponry. There's no lack of this in the Ummah. There's no lack of money. There's no lack of, of resources. There's no lack of even governments. Our luck is that we don't have Allah and Allah Rasulullah in our life. That's the biggest problem. So come on to Qal Allah, Qal Rasul. That's why I said the second thing was. And in addition to that, I said that we, and we have to do away with our personal egos. And number four is that we have to understand the needs of the community. And we have to make sure that we focus on this specifically. Now, this is why I'm going to share with you one thing before we finish, because I've got a few minutes left. And that is that some of the blocks to building this, this type of previous community is not understanding its true purpose, but number two, people wanting position for their own name and fame. It's all about me. It's all about my position, my authority. I want people to call me the leader, the Chaudhary, the Sheikh Sab, and so on. Hubbul Jah, the same thing. We may not say, oh, you know, Firaun is a, oh, he wasn't a bad, wasn't a nice person. But if we were given that same opportunity like Firaun, Allah forbid we may do the same thing. 
It's just we don't have the access. It's like one person, he was like, Alhamdulillah, I live in Saudi, never made zina. Never. Because you know you litter person, that's why. You know you get dealt with, bruv. It's like saying you're a person who's blind, oh, I never, saw, I never saw haram. Well, of course you never saw it. That's the whole point. Now chuck my man in the middle of Edgeware Road. Let's see what happens then. Astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive. But you get my point, yeah? It's easy to say, oh, I won't do it. Well, you haven't got the ability. Someone whose hands are chained. Oh, it's okay. I've never used my hands in the wrong, uh, you know, in the past hour, bro. Of course you haven't, because you're chained up. Oh, I haven't, uh, you know, blind man, I can't, I've never seen haram. We know that you haven't seen haram. So the point, I'm not negating, I'm not knocking back. I'm just giving that as an example. It's easy to say what I won't do because you don't have access to do it. But ask that youngster who is following the Quran and Hadith, who's following the example of the Salaf, the, the ulama, the mashaykh, the, the, and, 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 and goes to the university campus full in, in, in Islamic values. That's what you call dedication. That's what you call istiqama. You get me? But Hubbul Jah, that's what I mentioned. I mentioned about the, this is one of the blocks to building this community, these things which I said, is because people will assume positions and they're not thinking about the wider community. We need to do away with this for the wider benefit of the wider community. Very essential that we think like this. And one other thing, in addition to that, some of the things which are weakening our community is inter polemics or inner polemics, intra faith polemics. Do you guys know what I mean by that? I'll give you one simple example and you, you'll understand from this example. Sunni Vabi. Do you get it now, yeah? Uh, sorry to give you that example, but you, now you understand. That's what I mean by polemics. Like someone said to me, oh, yeah, so they gave some. What, what, you, uh, what's your manhaj, Jackie? Like, which fiqh are you following? All right, cool. Like, you know, uh, so that's the first thing you want to know. Everyone's, everyone's, everyone's judged by just manhaj or fiqh or where you're tying the hands. Allahu Akbar. You know, honestly, online is a joke. Online is a joke. All you got to watch is Hyde Park and you'll see this is what our ends. People arguing over the most finicky of things. And small things, debating like one and a half hours on... on, on I don't even want to say the argument because then you may put a thought in your mind and you may start Googling. It's the most ridiculous things that people are arguing over. 99.9% .9 of the things you all agree on. Bilke Shahitham Haddad from London, a senior one of our ulama, he's written a book. It's called... Al Aqida al Muttafaqa Bain al Muslimin. The things that we actually do agree on. It's funny because Muhammad Hijab actually had a lecture and he broke down the whole crux of the difference between Athari and Asha'ira. Now, if you're thinking, what's, what's that? Don't worry about it. If you don't know it, it's okay. Because Allah's not going to ask you whether you believe in Abu Mansur Maturidi or not. He's going to ask you if you're a Muslim. The first question is about Islam and Iman. So if you don't know it, don't worry about it. Okay, just take it out of your head. But for those youngsters who have a phone in their hand, they're going to say, bro, I see man like on Hyde Park and they're coming with aggressive energy and it, it seems attractive because they're so assertive. Well, if we don't do away with inner polemics, we're going to destroy ourselves from within. That's the other harm as well. Okay. And remember one thing is that we need to have an environment. This is another barrier in which we need to solve. We need to have an environment which few people can feel comfortable to voice their opinions. And what I mean by voicing their opinions, if you suppress voice and opinion in your community, it will manifest itself in uglier ways. People who think online and causing fitna, coming and challenging. See now, this is why I say, right, in order for, because you've got these youngsters that are building up this energy, they want their voices to be heard. I think honestly it's really effective to have a youth halaqa within the masjid, let them voice their concerns. And the ulama, if they can listen to that and cater for that within the boundaries of the deen, alhamdulillah, you'll squash a lot of fitna. And they'll feel that they're heard. And you know, sometimes the youngsters, they just want to get together and spend time with the ulama and have a pizza and just chill out. And So you have to be open to not too haram things. Na'udhu billah, ever, abadan, ever haram ever can be tolerated in the house of Allah or anywhere. I'm saying within the boundary of the deen, what can be catered for, you listen and you accommodate, inshallah. But there needs to be an avenue of voice where the youngsters can be heard, okay? Now the last question is, right, is that, okay, I've heard you, Rev. I want Islam to be superior. I want to create unity amongst my community. I want to think wider for the bigger community. I want to get involved. Tell me what to do. I'm here, labik. Okay, well, one of the things you can do, firstly, Make sincere dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it's not your ego that wants serving, you're actually doing it for the sake of Allah. First step, ikhlas. Ikhlas is the most important thing because you even have some people that want to hold programs. Look, Allah forbid, astaghfirullah, if, if we are trying to become popular, 
If you want to be noticed, if you want to gain clout, this is all going to fall against you on the day of judgment. It's better for you then for not to do it because you're destroying your own akhirah. So you have to have sincerity. And then number two, you have to remain within the boundaries of the deen and the sharia. Ah. Now check out this one. This is how, I'm telling you, this is the sort of stuff we get. I was imam once upon a time. One brother phoned me and he goes, Sheikh, I've got a big solution to the problem. We can have this program, we can bring sisters. And I'm like, okay, just tell me what this, Wallah al -Azim. He came up with this idea. We need to have a halal Muslim catwalk. <laughs> I'm like, what did you say? A, cat, a Muslim catwalk. I said, are you tapped? Are you tapped, bruv? Like, I normally, I'm, I was a lot more sensible. Like, I've, always, I've never really been 100% sensible, but we tried to be. But I was like, I normally I was like, brother, you know, you need to fear Allah. And... No, no, no. Are you dumb, bruv? Are you dumb? That's it. Tell me, just straight up, do you need help? Because we've got the medical hospital on the door. A landing green home masjid. I couldn't believe, like, what sort of stupidity is that? Well, how can you even think of such a dumb thing? Like, as if we're going to be all right with that. So, my, I start for the, may Allah forgive me, I, I'm not saying that's how you speak to people. And I, 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 may, I, I, I told you I'm wet behind the ears, so don't take this as evidence. Ideally, it should have been, no brother, you know, we need to... But no, straight up, bro, you must be completely gone. But that's ridiculous. So I'm saying, always remain within the boundary of the deen. Ikhlas and remain within the boundary of the deen. Those shabab, and by the way, let me make it very clear. You know this thing here in front of me, there's ikhtilaf in this. Don't think you know everyone should do it. I ask categorically first, what's the culture of your masjid? I've been hundreds of, not hundreds, but many masajid, they're not into this. So don't. And our thing is not just to promote fitna and cause the ruckus in the community, we go with the flow. Alhamdulillah, it's not about that. But those, mashallah, you know, who have that vision that we, there's a gap, there's a void we need to fill, well, let's fill it then. Do you understand my point, yeah? So we don't think, go with the flow of your community. Go with the flow of your community, whatever your community is used to, you get me? But stay within the boundary of the deen. Where there's ikhtilaf, you consult your local ulama, go with the majority what they say. Wallahi, there's khair in that. Now, in my local area, it just so happens, it just so happened, one masjid is for, one masjid is against. So when I go for the masjid that's for, I've recorded. When I go for the masjid against, I don't record. Simple. Simple, that's it. You, you go with the flow of your own community. So it's sincerity and remaining within the boundary of the deen. Number three, in addition to that, if you genuinely want to get involved, don't just go up to a brother and say, like, this is what happens. Bro, next time you hold a program, yeah, let me know I'm ready, inshallah. Oh, inshallah. That's just like the tabligi charmi ne, inshallah. Kabi wani, bi salsi, inshallah. Bro, listen, go up to the brother who's involved in the program and say, here's my number. I'm sending you a text message. You have to notify me next time you do a program. And do it like that. If your masjid has a CV taking process, zabardast. Send the CV if, that, if you're on that level. If you're not, and then speak to the people. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sheikh, I'm sorry. Uh, Sheikh, get grips up Sheikh Omer and say, right, bro, this is my number. This is my... You don't need to send CVs, that's a bit more formal. But you know, if, you're, if you've got that in your masjid, if you haven't, then you give your number and say, whenever you hold a program, shout me up. I want to come. I want to I want a part of it. And wherever they ask you to do, they're not in there. You know, it's funny because I've had people that come to me and say, tell me what I want to become a speaker. Why do you want to be a speaker for? How do you know that I'm not earning my jahannam sitting here? How do you know that? How do you honestly know that I'm not doing this for fame? You don't know. And we're not, of course. I like to think I'm not. And I ask Allah to keep me on the straight and narrow and with ikhlas. Ameen, bolo, bhai. Jazakallah. We're free, inshallah. But the point is, everyone just sees a presence. Oh, I want a slice of that. I want to be known. What sort of, for what? And what? What's the end result? It's going to be a hujjah against you on the day of judgment. You know what the ikhla, wallah, that's why, you know, see, it's, it's, the khidma will be, we sit down and make mashura. Achabi, where's the khidma zurud? Okay, someone needs to do chokidari, someone needs to do security, one person needs to clean, one needs to serve. Whatever, bismillah, I'm ready for it, inshallah. Wherever the role is, you tell me. That's, when you, that's how you put yourself forward. So I said, be part of the community, ikhlas, within the boundary of the deen, put yourself forward for the community, and whatever art the community asks a need of you at the time and the necessity, you do what is necessity. Last but not least, Last but not least, is that in order for us to have thriving Muslim communities going forward, we need to think out of the box in terms of our educational needs of the community. Now, alhamdulillah, there was a time, mashallah, which is now still quite common. A lot of Muslims are involved in commerce and business, and I get that. But we need, if you're thinking longevity, bruv, 100 years in the future, why are Muslims not filling those academic roles that are needed within society? Where are the Muslim doctors? Where are the Muslim engineers? Where are the Muslim thinkers that can shape policy 
and shape international and national thinking. You've got opportunities on your doorstep. Some of the greatest universities in the UK think and for the sake of the benefit. And you're not thinking because I want to earn a package of wealth. You're thinking what? Al-Islam or Ya'la wa la Ya'la. I want Islam to be the, the best, the forefront, the Muslims to be at the academic forefront, the financial forefront. I want, I want my wider Muslim, non-Muslim community to see the real beauty of Islam. I want to help them. I want to benefit them. I want to enrich society. When you have that type of thinking, you won't think like a foreigner, you'll think like someone for the wider community. One issue, we've got one leg in, one leg out. So the father sends all his money to Jabbar or Gujar Khan, and they're building big, big plaza, and the kid has, you know, hasn't even got the attention of the father. I'm sorry, but you know, this may sound a bit harsh, but it's true. You know, 15 hour day taxis, why do you need all your koti bandri? Bindi. Bro, listen, I get that, do all that, but what about your kids? They're not going to identify with Pindi and Jabbar and Kashmir and Surud and Burush. They're going to have that affiliation and that love and respect that will always be there. And I'm not saying you don't send any money, always support your families. But to live like a foreigner, one leg in, one leg out. What are you, what are you doing for the wider community? You understand? May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq, inshallah. May Allah guide us and inspire us. As I said, you get me, I went over eight minutes, but it's okay. Inshallah. I can see some people, inshallah, but alhamdulillah, I hope some people have benefited. I hope everyone benefited. But the main thing is, guys, is that we need to become people of action. You can't just sit and talk. Bayan is 5% of the, of the effort. 5%. It's not the asal. Asal is effort. I can only instill an idea. And the idea simply was understanding community, the benefit of being part of a community, and different things that become a block to building that community and what we need to do on an individual and a collective basis. As a summary, there's a lot that was covered, but that's basically it. Start small, inshallah. Do what you can for your local area, man. Have that real thicker, that real concern. We're only passing through here on a temporary stage. The little good I can do, alhamdulillah, will help me on Yawm Al-Qiyam and help my community to survive, to survive, stay alive and thrive. Inshallah. Allah ta'ala inspire us. Wa akhirat da'wana. Alhamdulillah.